The Arctic cold has arrived. We're in for several days of bitter cold and snowy conditions. CDOT's prepared. Our team is making sure you are too. There's been a lack of accountability. Concerns over delayed and slow response times by Denver Health ambulances. We, we know it. We've seen it. This, these reports are exactly what we see in the streets. Following a three-month Denver 7 investigation, tonight a veteran firefighter is sounding the alarm, saying this happens far too often and change needs to happen. A deadly dose and a growing trend. Still really seems like the dream. Fentanyl is killing Coloradans. And tonight, as a family grieves, local law enforcement have a warning for you. Well, the Arctic air has moved in. We've seen a more than 50 degree temperature swing in less than 24 hours. And everybody, let's settle in because the cold it is sticking around. Good evening and thanks so much for watching Denver 7 News at 10. I'm Andrew Heaton. I'm Shannon Ogden. Glad you're here tonight. And in addition to the cold, we're in for some snow. CDOT crews already have been deployed to keep our highways and roads clear. Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson is here tracking the Arctic air and the radar. Good evening, Mike. Hey, you guys, the record books will show that on this President's Day, the high temperature in Denver reached 55 degrees. It was almost 70 over southeast Colorado. But the story is the cold air settling in now. From that 55, we have dropped to 7 above 0 now. And it's 2 below up at Sterling and below 0 across southeast Wyoming. And with combine the winds, it feels like 25 below zero on exposed skin in Sterling, 11 below here in the Denver. As you can see, it's milder, relatively speaking, over southwestern Colorado. And that's because the leading edge of this Arctic air hasn't quite gotten there yet. But the moisture is pouring into western Colorado, and that's where the weather warnings are in effect for one to three feet of snow for the mountains over the next couple of days. On the eastern plains, it's wind chill advisories. And there's a little bit of snow showing up, not very much, but this view from Boulder shows that we have snow on the ground, and that's typical along the front range. So here are the weather headlines overnight. We have Denver turning into Denver for the next few days with periods of light snow below zero temperatures by Wednesday morning and near zero tomorrow morning. Most of the snow is in the mountains, but we'll get some on the plains as well. I will show you how much to expect with this bitter blast coming up in just a few minutes. And warming shelters have opened up across the metro to keep people off the streets during this frigid weather. In Fort Collins, people needing overnight shelter should go to Catholic Charities or the Fort Collins Rescue Mission. Today, we also visited Samaritan House here in Denver, which serves women. This shelter has 270 beds, and as of this afternoon, 190 beds were already in use, and we're told about 250 beds will likely be filled tonight and over the coming days. And as the temperatures drop to single digits, XL Energy reminds Coloradans conserve energy. Lower your thermostat to 58 degrees when you're not at home. And here's also some ways you can save some money on your energy bill. Clean your filters. Dirty filters in the furnace reduce airflow and make it harder for your furnace to do its job. And you can also lower the temperature on your water heater by just 10 degrees, and that will save you between 3 and 5% on water heating costs. And no matter the time of day, you can get updated weather forecasts and radar on the free Denver 7 Plus app for your streaming device. When you dial 911 calling for an ambulance, you want and expect a quick response. Well, tonight, several Denver firefighters are sounding an alarm about understaffing and dangerous delays by Denver Health paramedics. Denver 7 Investigates has uncovered several internal emails in which firefighters are questioning the response times of Denver Health paramedics. Here's our chief investigative reporter, Tony Kovaleski. These things need to be said. Department policy says he's not supposed to be in front of this camera. These stories need to come out. Frustrations bubbling over after more than 15 years responding to calls and trying to save lives. When you actually see people dying in your hands, it weighs on you heavier, which is why I'm happy to be here and have this conversation. With his image in silhouette and his voice digitized, this veteran firefighter agreed to talk after learning Denver 7 Investigates has obtained these emails from other Denver firefighters. The emails are saying what we all know is that there has been a long time problem with how long it takes an ambulance to arrive on scene. Internal communications written by Denver firefighters and obtained by Denver 7 confirm those concerns. From October of last year, we waited 25 minutes for an ambulance. A trend of waiting longer and longer for ambulances is concerning. 
from September of last year. We waited for 30 minutes, and this issue has been getting worse over the past two months. From May of last year, an auto accident. The patient was unconscious at the time. I was also told Denver Health had no ambulances available. What do these emails say? They, they speak volumes. I get the frustrations. I, I agree with the frustrations because I've been on those calls too. Prior to this interview, the chief of Denver's fire department reviewed the emails and watched Denver 7 investigations from last year. They're not in it for what's right for the patient. It needs to be investigated. The culture needs to change. Investigations where veteran paramedics questioned the culture and priorities inside Denver Health. Based on our reporting, would you say we identified a problem? I would say based on your report, you identified numerous problems. Engine 3, respond to an assault at 2323 Curtis Street. And there are also questions about this call from last November. The email says the call was for a head injury resulting from domestic violence. In this official correspondence, a Denver firefighter writes, the patient wanted to go to the hospital. Several ambulances were diverted. According to the firefighter, a paramedic who arrived in an SUV, not an ambulance, advised the patient that she would probably get to the hospital faster if she walked, because St. Joseph's Hospital is four blocks away. Help me understand, is there any plausible reason to tell a person to walk four or 14 blocks to a hospital? There would never be a plausible reason to tell any person to walk 14 blocks to a hospital. We wanted to understand what that trained paramedic was asking of the woman who reportedly called for help, had a head injury, and wanted an ambulance. So we're gonna walk that distance, starting from here at 23rd and Curtis. We've now walked about a half mile in eight minutes. Walk. Remember, the paramedic reportedly said it was only four blocks. Reality, it was more than a mile, about 14 blocks, a trip that took us more than 21 minutes. What's your analysis of that call? I think the system worked perfectly. The chief paramedic for Denver Health said after reviewing reports on that call, but never talking to the paramedic, he concluded his team did nothing wrong. So you didn't talk to the paramedic, but you've concluded that they did the right thing. I believe in our people and I trust them. Are you saying what this firefighter put in the email is not the truth? I'm saying I don't believe they had the entire story. Which leads us to the entire story on response times by Denver Health Ambulances. How common are delayed, extremely delayed response times from Denver Health? It feels regular. And again, the problem is I don't have the data, we don't have the information to know how often it actually happens. But talk to any firefighter, talk to any paramedic. They know it happens all the time. We asked Denver Health to provide a database of all ambulance response times during the past six months, citing protections provided by state lawmakers. The hospital declined our request. Does this need to be fixed? absolutely needs to be fixed. Has our reporting provided you leverage to potentially find a solution here? I hope so. <laughs> we played those testimonials for Denver Health's chief paramedic. Reaction to what you heard there? I hear frustration and I see opportunity for us all to do better as a EMS safety team. Although Denver Health elected to not release data showing response times, the hospital did admit in this interview Firefighters were correct, and for only the second time in 22 years, ambulances last year failed to meet the standard of arriving on scene in less than nine minutes, 90% of the time. These emails, those testimonials raise a question about your paramedic division. How do you respond to that? We will do better. And consider this fact, there are currently more than 50 Denver firefighters licensed and trained as paramedics. But under the current guidance of Denver Health, they are not allowed to use their advanced life supporting skills when they respond to calls. That's another part of the conflict and the frustration. I'm Chief Investigative Reporter Tony Kovaleski.
And Denver Health says change is in the works because it failed to meet the required response time threshold last year. The hospital will add four more ambulances and 33 frontline EMS providers this year, a move designed to improve response times. Five friends celebrating on a Saturday night killed by a deadly dose of fentanyl they never knew they were taking. Tonight, family and friends are remembering their loved ones they lost. And as Denver 7 CB Cotton reports, local investigators are warning this could have happened to anyone. Here you go. The solace of a front porch is no match for the grief Dan Marquez is facing. It, it must have just took him just like that. Speaking to our Denver 7 crew on Monday, Dan Marquez was candid about what took his son's life. Fentanyl's no good, man. It's, it's the devil. His son, 24-year-old Sam Marquez, and his son's wife were two of the five people found dead in this Commerce City apartment on Sunday. Now Dan and his wife are caring for the couple's child. Loved his job. He's always talking about his job, talking about his new daughter. He loved his daughter. The district attorney has confirmed it was fentanyl poisoning after the group unknowingly ingested laced cocaine. Still really seems like the dream or whatever, you know, it's just it's not reality. But the dangers of fentanyl are a reality and no one is safe. Folks think that they know what they're taking. They know what their dosage is. They know what they can handle. Um, but more and more often, very common drugs like cocaine, like heroin, even um, tabs of ecstasy are being cut with fentanyl, which is an extremely powerful um, and dangerous um, opioid. And when ingested, people die almost immediately. Dr. Jennifer Tippett specializes in research surrounding substance use. She says everyone should test their drugs no matter how often they use. And I tell people all the time is fentanyl testing strips are available readily. You can get them on Amazon. They're real cheap. Um, if you are someone who dabbles infrequently, maybe as a celebratory um, kind of measure, it's really good to have those on hand just in case. Loved ones tell Denver 7 none of the five people who died were regular users of any drugs, but rather friends who were trying to celebrate for the night, a night that turned into tragedy because of fentanyl. CB Cotton, Denver 7. And we want to stress this isn't just happening to habitual drug users. Because fentanyl is so prevalent nowadays, this can happen to anyone, and the numbers are alarming. Let's go in depth. In 2021, the DEA told Denver 7 90% of black market pills seized in Colorado are fake, meaning they contain another substance. 25% of those contain a deadly amount of fentanyl, and it doesn't take much fentanyl to kill someone. Just two milligrams of fentanyl can be deadly, and that's about the size of an ant. It really expands the, the reach of Denver Bronco, the Denver Broncos globally. And the highest bidder is, well, we don't know yet, but with the Broncos up for sale, a group of crypto enthusiasts wants to be the team's next owner. In a way, it's kind of like crowdfunding. Their plan to raise billions to purchase the team and why it may be pushing NFL rules. It's an uphill battle, frankly, because the NFL has, on many occasions, made it well known that they prefer to have a very wealthy individual uh, on a team. 